So I think I'd like to start out talking about just how important um, early intervention uh, was for me. Okay. It was very, very important. When I was two and a half years old, I had all the full-blown symptoms, no speech, constant tantrums, and by age two and a half, I got into a very good early intervention program with a lot of speech therapy, one-on-one. -on -one. Another thing that was emphasized was how to take turns at games, waiting and taking turns. It was a really important thing they were going to teach me. Also, they always gave me an opportunity to use my words. So they knew I wanted something that asked me to say it. And one of the things you've got to do is to give that kid time to respond. They're kind of like a phone that is um, on one bar, takes time to respond. And the thing about the little kids is some of them, you can push them harder than others. My speech teacher used to grab me by the chin. That worked for me. But for another child, you will drive them into sensory overload and that will not work. A good teacher knows just how much to push to get progress. And little kids take a lot of one-to-one -one interaction. People argue over the exact therapies being used, but I've observed that a good teacher does a lot of the same things no matter what the name of the therapy is. They know just how hard to push. If you don't push a little bit, you get no progress. So I tell parents you need 20 hours a week, one-to-one -one with an effective teacher. And I'm talking here about three-year-olds. And what would be an effective teacher? You get more speech, less tantrums, more skills, like you know, using the toilet, um, dressing, showering, just basic skills. And then when the child finally does get verbal, the way to teach social skills is what I call teachable moments. So let's say, for example, I stir a drink with my finger Instead of screaming no, the teacher should say, use the spoon. You give the instruction instead of saying no. And at one meal, you might have two or three of these teachable moments, and you just kind of use those moments. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been in the meat industry for years, and I've designed equipment that's used in many of the big meat packing plants. And when I go into that world, that's the world that I've been in the most, I have going to guess that about 20% of the people that I worked with were either ADHD, autistic, or dyslexic. And I am saying that absolutely seriously. In fact, ADHD and, and autism get mixed up all the time. Both the brain scans and the behavior have about a 30% overlap. Huh. Uh, the special ed department basically you know, kind of builds the stuff. Another thing I've been observing, and this is especially on the type of autism where there's no speech delay, I have all kinds of grandfathers coming up to me, and they discover that they're autistic when the grandkids get diagnosed. Mm. So why did that grandfather have a good career, like an engineer or an accountant? It's because he learned how to work. Yeah, and we need to teach that to kids too. Now, in a few of these slides I'm going to show right now, I want to ask a really important question. What would happen to some of these great minds if they were in today's educational system? And we can put the first slide up. Here we go. And uh, well, we find now we're not on the first slide. There's the first slide. There's Michelangelo. All right, let's go and look a little bit more stuff about Michelangelo on the next slide or Beethoven. What would happen to these guys today? If they were in today's educational system, in today's system, what would happen to them? That's the thing I want you to really think about. Let's go to the next slide. There's some of Michelangelo's art. We can go on to the next slide. And here's some information about Michelangelo. He was a horrible student. When he was 12 years old, he dropped out of school. Uh, he loved art. He didn't want to study how to make business documents and become a lawyer. Uh, his father hated art, but he was in an, in an era where there was lots of art around. Well, the churches were, um, you know, commissioning great artworks, and he was um, raised by um, a, a stonecutter, so he would have been exposed to some of the tools that um, he would use for sculpture. This brings up a very important thing about careers. In order for a student to get interested, and here's a student that was a really bad student, 
he's got to get exposed to the art and get exposed to some of the tools. And that's something that happened. If he hadn't been exposed to those things, I don't know what he would have been doing. Um, and that's um, hearing here from Sarah Johnson, one of the panelists, she's saying at least here in California, they're taking a more tailored approach. But today we've got a lot of kids that aren't getting exposed to enough stuff to find out what they might be interested in. I get asked all the time, how did I end up in the cattle industry? I ended up in the cattle industry because I was exposed to cattle when I was a teenager. That's the reason why. Now, maybe I might have been exposed to them, I might have decided I didn't like them. But the thing is, you don't know what you like and you don't know what you're gonna hate until you're exposed to it. I think kids need to get out and do lots of things. We can go to the next slide. And uh, Beethoven, uh, when he was older, did some of his greatest accomplishments uh, when he was going deaf. He had a rotten childhood. Um, and he got so deaf he had to give up performing. He wrote Ode to Joy when he was totally stone deaf. We'll go on to the next slide. And before he went completely deaf, he built this uh, contraption on the piano to help magnify the sound. Mm. He had special pianos made that he could pound on and not break. Um, this is the kind of attitude I like towards disability. It's sort of like figure out what you can do. In fact, Stephen Hawking said, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. And the only thing that Stephen Hawking could really do well was math in his head. And he did that very well. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is one of my most important slides. The different kinds of minds. When kids get around six, seven, eight years old, and you've exposed them to a whole lot of different things, some kids are going to be the art mind. They're going to be the object visualizer. That's me. And the kind of careers that we would be good in are things like industrial design, graphic design, also things like skilled trades, such as fixing cars, um, building things. Now, my kind of mind absolutely can't do algebra. I'm saying kids that can't graduate from high school and go into auto mechanic shop because they failed algebra. To this day, I haven't passed an algebra class. I managed to get out of it. Fortunately, back in 1967, <laughs> it wasn't a required math class. I'm not suggesting a total getting out of math, but how about going right straight to geometry? And scientifically, I am, I am what is called an object visualizer. And if you watch the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, it shows exactly how I think. Uh, everything I think about is a picture. That is how I think. Now, another kind of mind is the visual spatial mathematical mind. Think patterns. These kids often have trouble with reading. Yes, and we do need to work on reading. Uh, in order to function in the business world, you need a sixth grade level of reading. That I've got to get you up to that level of reading. And you can run a business at that level of reading. Um, but that's patterns. Well, you see a kid who's good at math, move them ahead in math. Expose them to computer programming. I had a chance to, I watched the uh, SpaceX uh, space station docking. I geeked out on two and a half hours of live feed. This is total NASA geek out. <laughs> and um, I found out that the, the um, computer displays in the Dragon spaceship are done with JavaScript. That's the same thing that video games and Minecraft play on. You can look that stuff up online. Interesting. There's all kinds of free stuff online. Code.org. You can find all kinds of programming stuff online. There's also really cool pattern stuff you can find online. Type protein symmetry into, uh, into, into Google Images, and you'll find beautiful geometric shapes that look like cathedral windows, and they're inside your body. That's a really cool thing to show the math kids. Then what was that got, temple again? That was protein symmetry? Okay. Protein symmetry. Okay, thank you. On Google Images, type in protein symmetry. Yep. Or you um, type in fractals. And you just start typing math words into uh, Google Images. You find all the cool websites. Another great website for the math edge is Wolfram Mathematica. Okay, just think wolf. He eats the shape. Yep. And ram, that's a male shape. Wolfram Mathematica. A great website uh, for math heads. 
And then you have a kid that's the verbal facts thinker. They, um, everything is words. And I'm learning more and more how verbal thinking is different from being visual thinking. And I'm getting concerned that our school system is screening out a lot of us visual thinkers. And I'm working right now on a new book just on visual thinking. We need visual thinkers to prevent messes like Fukushima. Um, well, the engineering didn't, could, didn't calculate the tsunami coming over the seawall, but if you read the historical data, I could see the tsunami coming over the seawall and drowning the mm. Fukushima plant. In yeah. fact, the mathematicians did a great job of designing the plant so it tolerated the earthquake. It shook really hard, it shook really hard, nothing broke. Everything was fine. 40 minutes later, the tsunami drowned it. Yeah. And they did not have watertight doors. Simple, old-fashioned technology designed originally for ships. They didn't have them. You see, the thing that's important is you need all the different kinds of minds. And then you've got some people that are auditory thinkers. Um, they don't have good visual perception, so they, they use their ears more. Well, while I've got this up here, let's talk about some of the sensory issues that you can get in autism. Sensory issues are real. Some of the problems that I had is I, I uh, couldn't tolerate sudden loud noise. I hated balloons popping. Well, now I know a way to get over that. I could take a balloon and I could blow it up maybe this big. And then I take a pin and pop it where I control it. And then we make it maybe this big. Then we make it maybe this big. So it's a little louder each time, but I pop. One of the ways to get a kid over being afraid of a sound like a hair dryer or a vacuum cleaner is to let that child control that thing. And then that reduces the big startle effect. That's, That's one of the ways to let them control it. You might have a kid that's wearing headphones to block out sound. Now, it's okay to have that headphone with you all the time. That's fine. But try not to wear it. Again, give them the control over the sound. Um, but that's the key. They control it. I take the pin and pop the balloon. Yeah. Starting out with a little tiny balloon that's only going to go poof, and then a bigger one that's going to make a louder pop. That's, it. that's great. An, there's been an issue with wearing masks. This is where you give a kid choices. You're going to have to wear one, but you can pick it within reason. With, you know, we're going to have a price uh, limit on it. Uh, and learn how to wear it before we go to the airport. There was a horrible case where Southwest Airlines just threw a family off a plane, not yep. wearing a mask. One of the secrets with a lot of these kids is no surprises. We don't go to the airport and then all of a sudden you have to wear a mask. That's something you need to practice at home a lot. But you're going to have some choices. You can even get fun masks that fun animal mouths and things on them. There's fun masks you can get. So you take something that, that I consider obnoxious and there's a lot of different types of them. I yeah. find some of them are more comfortable than others. I've gotten, I've worn some, I just hate them. And there's others. I'm not going to say that I'm in love with masks, but I can um, tolerate wearing it and it's required. And I went grocery shopping yesterday and you have to wear a mask. And there's a big sign right there and a security guard at one of the grocery stores. Yeah. He counts the people going in. And if there's too many people in the store, then he makes you wait outside. Yeah. He has a little counter in his hand. Yeah. He's counting customers with it. Temple, I got a question for you on this slide yeah. here. Okay. You, you have, you, have uh, you, you do talk a lot. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate to see you a few times and you talk about that, you know, you're a visual thinker. Um, how would, is there ways that, let's say a family with a child who's very young and is nonverbal, how they could assess whether or not there's a likelihood on how their child, how their child thinks, visual, spatial. Uh, no, no, no. It, not that's something that has to happen over time. No. This is something where my ability in art didn't really start to show up until second and third grade. That's going to be seven and eight years old. And then I would draw the same horse head over and over again now, what you want to do is take that fixation and broaden it. Let's draw the entire horse. Draw it saddle. Draw it stable. Maybe we draw a place you ride it to. You see how I'm broadening that? Maybe we draw a picture of the place we ride the horse to. You see, and I'm getting an associative link. If a kid likes cars, we can study the mathematics of cars, the physics of cars, uh, the art and styling of cars. I'm old enough to come from the car fin era. You got to look up some of the cars, my childhood cars, giant thin, thin mobiles. Sure. 
you know, really pretty crazy. Um, you know, that's designed by the art side of, um, you know, industrial design side of engineering. I think that's, that's something that I, we've all we've observed a lot, and it's a lot of discussions about that, especially about how to, let's say, support uh, kind of in-home learning as well as uh, learning inside of more, you know, ac academia institution of trying to really assess a child's interest in, in, in utilizing that to perpetuate learning in maybe a variety of subjects. There doesn't seem to be necessarily a lot of that being taken advantage of. And what you're saying is, hey, you know, this individual may be interested in this, utilize that as a catalyst to perpetuate skills. Well, that's right. And the thing is, kids have to be exposed to a lot of stuff. You take the kids that love Legos. Yep. Mathematicians like Legos, but so do visual thinkers. Um, but if you didn't expose them to Legos, you wouldn't see that skill. Now, one of the mistakes I'm seeing right now is you've got a kid who loves Legos. He's 16 years old, and nobody thought to expose him to tools. That's yeah. just absolutely ridiculous. I was using a hammer and a screwdriver and pliers when I was in second grade, and I was taught how to use them safely. Every kid in our neighborhood was uh, hammering nails and old boards, and, and I, it, I, I would cut coat hangers with the pliers, and I had to bend them back and forth a whole lot, get it to cut. I but how can a kid find out he likes tools if he's never exposed to them? Because for visual thinkers, uh, one of the really good fields is auto mechanics, uh, welding where you can read uh, drawings. Yeah. In fact, I've heard of three uh, young adults that were very much addicted to video games and they introduced them to car mechanics. And they, they found out they liked the car mechanics better than they liked the video games. That's how they got them off the video games, by, mm. by showing them other stuff that they could do. And people tend to stick their nose up to skilled trades. But in this country right now, we're losing skills. I went to a state-of-the-art poultry processing plant last year. And the equipment inside that plant was shipped from Holland in 100 shipping containers. Because mm. we don't make it anymore. Because the kids that ought to be making that clever machine that packages the poultry are in the basement playing video games. See, there's a relationship here. Yeah. Losing skills. And most of the people I work with are, um, are retired. You see, yeah. I go back and forth between the worlds. Yeah. And this brings up a really important thing about identity. Being a professor, a scientist, yes, and a designer. And after I get off of here, I got to draw a little mechanical design engineering drawing. I've got to draw for a guy that we're working on a project right now. And my identity is more a designer, yeah. a professor. Autism is secondary. Autism is an important part of who I am. I like the logical way I think, but it's secondary to career. And I think it's so important to have, you know, an interesting career. Now, I was just talking to somebody the other night. Her husband's making $100,000 a year doing coding for a tech company. And he's as autistic as he can be. And he wastes money on all kinds of stupid things. Um, you go out to Silicon Valley. You've got all these programmers out there. You take one look at these programmers, you know they're on the autism spectrum. They avoid the labels. Now, this particular guy that I just um, talked to his wife, um, he, um, uh, his, his personal life's a complete mess. That's where maybe accepting a label might be helpful. His professional life's doing, going just fine. He's a really good coder. Yeah. Now, if he had never been exposed to coding, how could he find out whether he liked it? I tried coding. It did not work for me. Mm -hmm. But the, you see, that this, that's just not my kind of mind. But I'm a big believer in exposing kids to a lot of different things. When I was in college, I took a world literature course that I thought I was going to hate. And I ended up loving it. Because the professor explained about how what the author at the time was sort of trying to get across that was, went beyond what the story was. I'm talking about skill trades. This is my book, Calling All Minds. It's cool projects for little kids to do. And it includes simple things like paper airplanes, because I'm finding that one third of the kids in Denver, little kids, maybe, you know, eight years old, had never made a paper airplane. They had never cut out a paper snowflake. And I had somebody ask me, well, what if it falls apart and they cut it out wrong? Is that going to hurt his self-esteem? I said, no, he's going to learn from the mistakes. 
It's a piece of printer paper. That's all it is, a piece of printer paper. Don't worry about that. You get another piece of printer paper. That's right. And you cut it right so it doesn't fall apart. You know, that's, what, you know, that's the reason you why you, you uh, learn how to do things with stuff that's not expensive. I what remember you, when I was about 13, I ruined a sewing project. I cut the fabric too quickly, and I had to throw the whole thing away because I cut it wrong. Well, me, what do you think from, about a lot of families or individuals who, especially in, in their young years, they display a, um, a significant interest in you know, these computer games? So there's two part they're question. Addicted, they're getting addicted to them too much too. So and a lot of those kids are not going into the trades building, you know, making computer games. The other problem with that industry, and if you go into it, every kid wants to design uh, computer games. So there's a glut of designers. I don't recommend that as a computer field to go into yeah. because uh, they, it's all gig economy. And as soon as the game gets made, they just lay off and I, uh, you know, you're better off doing business computing because you'll sure. have a job for the rest of your life. Now, somebody asked up there, I'm going to answer some of these questions about multiple intelligence. It's actually Gardner's multiple intelligence, not Google's. And, and he has other things in there like kinesthetic and uh, where mine are just the thinking. But basically what I have to say is part of that. Now, what somebody else said, is the hands-on work all going to be phased out by automation? No. Somebody has to fix all that automated equipment. Look at all the gadgets you've got on the automated, on the self-driving car. Somebody has to fix this stuff. Those are some great jobs and they're not going to go away. Now, many of the things I did, I went in the back door. I was talking to a family down in the Southeast and their teenager couldn't do algebra. What are you gonna do? But he could build things. I said, you see that Amazon warehouse a mile down the road, get a job there. Now you go work every job on that floor. You work your butt off in there. And then you gravitate over towards fixing things. But not until you've worked your butt off on every job. 15 years from now, you can design the next warehouse. I have seen that career path in the meat industry. I have seen people do that. Mm. Where they came in and they got a job on the line. And then they learned all the jobs. And then one lady, she ended up running the whole line. First, the, guy tried, the guys tried to run her off of the slaughter line by giving her the worst jobs. But she stuck with it. And she ended up running a whole line. Another guy just started out working on the line. 15 years later, he's building a new cooler and he gets to play with giant Legos with a crane. <laughs> you know, this is stuff I have actually seen. Yeah. No, there's going to be people, people have to fix stuff. Heating and air conditioning. You think a robot's going to go up and in, install an air conditioner on somebody's roof? I don't think so. Not anytime soon. Okay, somebody asks here about speaking in sentences. Um, my speech came in one stressed word at a time. I had trouble getting it out. And in fact, I've had some very fancy uh, diffusion tensor imaging brain scans, and I had less fibers for the uh, fiber bundle in the brain for speak what you, you see. And when you work on the speech therapy or the ABA or whatever method you use, you can increase the bandwidth on the fibers that remain. You can't build more fibers, but you can make the ones you've got get more efficient. What does that mean, Temple, a little in terms of like the day-to-day -day engagement and high and your expectations for your child? So you're, you're well, you just if, if it gradually improves. Okay. It didn't, it didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual improvement. Now, when grown-ups talked slowly to me, yeah, um, I could understand. When grown-ups talked fast, it went into gibberish. Okay. I thought grown-ups had their own foreign language. They're, I called it grown-up talk. Literally. And, and that's, now, there are individuals that remain nonverbal. And I think what's happening with some of those is they'll make sounds that sound like vowel, vowel sounds. They're not hearing any of the consonants. If I said dog, they might hear, oh, that's all they're hearing. And so that's an auditory processing problem. Then you're going to have a problem with getting speech out. So I had a really bad, couldn't get it out, and a moderate auditory processing problem, which I still have. I can't um, hear in a noisy restaurant. Still can't. And it's gotten worse now that one ear's going to pretty well deaf now. Then another kind of speech problem is echolalic. Well, that kid, he, does, he acts out all these movie scripts, but he's got absolutely no idea what the movie scripts mean. And what you got to do is take that movie script and start working it into 
some of those phrases from that in the real world. Then you'll learn that words have meanings. But that's basically how um, how a kid um, three ways a language can be messed up in the brain. It's about that simple. Yeah. But I think it is valuable how you, you do talk a lot about uh, really being very, as a support for, like for yourself growing up, for example, your mother and others around you were very diligent about being being smart about how they were supporting, slowing their you know their speech down, uh, and then you over time learning that these day to day expectations and uh, approaches how that kind of stimulated success for you as an individual as well. Well, one thing is mother and the local school got together. Little okay. small school, regular school, 12 kids in a class, and mother and the, and the principal and the third grade teacher got on the same wavelength. So it was very consistent rules between home and school. Now, reading was a problem. I was in, brought up in the 50s, Dick and Jane books. Oh, I can't think of anything more boring than Dick and Jane books. See Dick, run, run, run. And that did not work for me. So mother taught me to read with phonics. Let's start out with a book worth reading, like The Wizard of Oz, or maybe Harry Potter. Harry Potter, that's the best thing that ever happened to reading. I went over to Barnes & Noble when they had the, the midnight opening. I didn't stay for the opening, but when you've got um, little kids carrying around a great big, huge, fat book, and they want to learn how to read it, that's great. So what Mother did is she'd read a page of the book, and then she'd stop and get me to start sounding out my words. And the first thing she did is she taped the alphabet up on the wall and she had me memorize the sounds. A has two sounds, A and A. B is ba, C is ka. Then you combine things like, like cracker, you know, for C-R. And she had me sound out my words. Now, there's another kid where phonics is what you don't do. You see, some kids are phonics learners and some a whole word learner. Don't shove phonics down a whole word learner. You're going to mess them up. Huh. But I think it's important to expose to both and use the method that works. That, that's the important thing. And then very quickly, after mother worked with me for about an hour a day, four days a week, by the end of one semester, my reading went from first grade level up to sixth grade level. And now I'm a really good reader. Yeah. So people get way off too, too hard headed about different ways to teach reading. I don't really care how you teach reading. I think, it, you know, kids that are different, I think it's important to try a variety of methods and find out what works. Now, there's some kids that when they go to read, the print jiggles on the page. Now, this does not explain all dyslexia. Definitely doesn't. But it explains maybe 10% of it. See, in the back of your head, there's circuits for shape, color, motion, and texture. And they have to work together to form a graphics file. Scientists don't have any idea how it works, but strokes break it in really weird ways like stop motion coffee pouring, all yeah. of a sudden lose your color vision. Huh. And it's what basically happens either from a head injury or from a developmental delay is um, your brain's image stabilization software doesn't work because your eye moves all the time. Well, this computer's not jiggling all around huh. because it, uh, the brain stabilizes the image. Well, something's wrong with that. And, and uh, nobody knows how to fix it. But here's something crazy that sometimes works. And when something's cheap, safe, and takes me five minutes to try it, I don't need evidence-based. Colored paper. Try light blue. Okay, like on my book right here, you see that real pale light blue? Try the real pale pastels. Light lavender, light tan. Print the homework on that. I have seen that save college careers. Save them. Really? Okay. And, and uh, I was at a book signing, and a lady with a head injury came up. And she was looking through a book that had some pastel pages. And for her, it was light yellow, a background. And she says, it stopped jiggling. Thank you. You've saved me. Now she's going to go out and buy light yellow paper for her printer. And then you can also adjust the background on your computer to mm. different, you know, like maybe pale lavender. Play with the fonts, different fonts. Now, this, I want to make it very clear. This doesn't explain all dyslexia. But if something's this safe, this simple, and might work, I'm going to try it. It's just that, uh, that simple. Uh, you know, you need to be doing a, a lot of different things. Uh, the other thing is I spent 25 years in heavy construction. 
And the thing that I find is it changes my attitude about things. You sell jobs, you design them, you supervise construction, and then you got to start them up. Well, that means you got to get the kid out there and get a job. Yeah. And, and it's a different, it, it, it's a real can do. You got to figure out how to get stuff done. Like in March 12th, was my absolute last trip. And uh, they canceled all my speaking engagements. And I had a week to get my classes online. Yeah, so we, we managed to buy the last decent microphone in, in Best Buy. Okay, here's somebody who wrote about a plastic strip to look through. Yes, yeah, sometimes that does work. That's another simple little thing you can try if you want really cheap paper or cardboard and just try cutting different size slots. So you look at one row of type, two rows of type, or three rows of type. You can just try that. It's another simple little trick you can do. Can't hurt anything, and it might just help. You know, I like doing these really simple things. Let's see, any other questions on here? Um, using all the different methods. Um, well, I want to, I, I got to get a kid reading. And the other thing, when I got in to be a teenager, that's when all the bullying started. Didn't have it in elementary school. Because Mrs. Deach, my third grade teacher, used a method that's now called peer-mediated intervention. Yep. In other words, she explained to the other children that I had a handicap, but it wasn't visible like a wheelchair and that they needed to be helping me. Get into high school, I got kicked out of a, um, a normal big school. That was an absolute uh, complete mess. A kid called me a retard. I chucked a book at the kid and I, I ended up going to a special boarding school. And for the first uh, three years I was there, I ran the school's horse barn. I didn't do any studying. Yeah. But you know what? I learned how to work. Yeah. And that's one of the big problems I'm seeing today. Kids are not learning how to work. And then when I talk to these grandparents, I'm finding out that they had paper routes when they were age 11. Well, I know that's not available now, but there's dogs that can be walked. There's trash cans that can be taken out for the neighbors. Let's just look for things they can do. When COVID finally gets over with and we get a vaccine, and uh, some other countries are already vaccinating right now. And uh, then church volunteer jobs. These kids have got to learn how to do a job outside the home on a schedule where somebody else is the boss. That's really, really important. Church volunteer jobs, help out at the farmer's market. You know, unfortunately, COVID shut a lot of this stuff down. But... Uh, you know, there's still, you know, we got to, but learning the work skills, because I'm seeing situations where you get a smart 16 year old on our student and he's never gone shopping. Yeah. Like, you got to be kidding. Mm -hmm. I was shopping at age seven and eight. And I was giving a little, I was given 50 cents a week for allowance. I can tell you, in the 50s, you could buy a lot with 50 cents. Today, it'd be $5 <laughs> for the same amount of stuff at the dollar store. But I knew exactly what I could buy with that. I could get five comics with it. And if I wanted that 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. I was learning that as a very young child about saving and budgeting. That's not a hard, difficult thing to do. But, uh, the stuff that you're sharing, really, I can't stop. I, one of the presentations I went to uh, a few years ago, your mother was there and she presented yeah. uh, alongside you. And uh, one of the things that I left there being just that really impacted me was how your mom's approach and the expectations, something to the effect of, you know, if Johnny next door is going to be doing it more or less, you know, temples can do it too. And having that kind of expectation. So it seems to be this kind of this, this thread of things that you're saying. One of them is uh, exposure. Try different things. Try stuff. Don't, don't be complacent with you know, making assumptions that this is all that's going to be your, your child is capable of doing. Expose them to things. And there's a persistence of that and a support structure that was coming from your mother at the same time and, and the school system around the you. The other thing you can't do, what you have to do is you got to stretch these kids. You can't take the kid and just put, shove me into a bunch of balloons popping. Okay. Well, that's the kind of thing you can't do. The other thing where I still have a problem, and a lot of minds that are different, I don't care if they're autistic, learning, disabled, whatever you want to call them, is processor speed. 
And this is something I like engineering terminology. We have to do a workaround because yep. you're not going to fix my processing speed. And this has, this is part of why I can't hear the noisy environment. Don't put me on the takeout window at a crazy busy McDonald's too much multitasking. The other thing is I cannot, I cannot remember long strings of verbal sequence. That's not going to work. Any task that has sequence, I need a pilot's checklist. So let's say I was working at McDonald's and I got to tear apart the ice cream machine. Step one, step two, step three, give me a pilot's checklist. Nope. Tear down steps, cleaning steps, reassembly steps. Okay. I just so need one or two keywords for each step to jog the memory. That's a simple thing to do because the processor speed is a problem. If I was a computer, I'd be an Intel 286 and a cloud for memory. Got you. <laughs> yeah, I've got, um, and the processor speed is something that you got to work around. You have that, you're not fixing that one. That one of the things that we try to talk about a lot as a, as a organization supporting the community is a lot of the quote unquote interventions, if you will, that we uh, try to try to teach the children, teach the, 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 the families how to, uh, uh, how to provide these things for the children. For example, a TA, the checklist, right? And the, a lot of the questions are, well, what, how does this benefit my child in the future? And what you're saying right now is you utilize those types of things still today. You as an individual use these checklists. If to I had to get a job at some restaurant and I got to tear some piece of equipment down and clean and put it back together, I would today make a little checklist and stick it in my pocket yeah. of the steps. Yeah. And I had to make little checklists of, of things on computers when I had to learn it. Yeah. I still have to do that. Now, after I've done the job for enough time, eventually I can throw the checklist away. But let me tell you, for pilots, they're not optional. Yeah. And you might want to look up the checklist for Cessna. I went and I looked up the checklist. I found the, the whole pilot's checklist for the Dreamliner plane. And the thing that's interesting is they chunk it. There's 100 items on the checklist. They don't throw 100 items at the pilot. It's chunked. Mm -hmm. Pre-taxi, pre-takeoff. Then you get up to the where you leave air traffic control and go to the highways in the sky. There's another checklist. It's chunked. And there may be five to eight items in each chunk. Gotcha. Aviation uh, has something to teach us on this. Yeah. And they've started getting doctors to do it so they don't leave instruments inside you after they do surgery. And doctors, are, doctors can be really arrogant. They don't like pilots coming in there and telling them what to do. <laughs> but these are things that, that even today – something where uh, like for directions well now you have gps but before those gps if i had to get directions on how to drive somewhere if there was more than three turns i had to write them down always had to write them down yep because i simply don't i the processor speed yep. that's you got to do a workaround but that's a very simple little thing and so somebody's teaching me to tear apart this machine and clean it or whatever it is I'll just write down the steps and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll make a checklist with just one to three keywords. And that's the way a pilot's checklist works. It jogs the memory. Gotcha. No, that's something I still have to do because employers get mad. They say, well, I'm going to show them how to do that, how to unjam the copier five times. Like what's wrong with this stupid kid? Yeah. yeah. No, that's where you write it down. Uh, visual stimming. I was allowed to have some time after lunch to stim. And then at the dining room table, it wasn't allowed. Now, there's some kids that have a lot more severe sensory issues, and they're going to need more breaks to do, um, uh, to do stimming, just to calm down. It, it's, uh, uh, they're, they're going to need some sensory breaks. And then you might, I'm a shameless book promoter. This is the way I see it. It's my most basic book on autism. Lots of little chapters, the way I see it. You don't have yeah. to read the whole thing. Just pick around and pick out the chapters. It's got tips on sensory stuff, on speech, uh, learning to drive. Okay, here's another processor problem. Driver's ed chucks them into it way too quickly. I did 200 miles on dirt roads for a touch traffic. I'm really thankful that my aunt's mailbox was three miles away on a dirt road because that gave me six miles a day at driving practice. You see, what you got to do to deal with a little tiny 286 Intel processor chip 
uh, that's what I got, is you got to get operation of the car into motor memory before you touch traffic. That solves the small processor problem. Gotcha. More time practicing in a really safe place before you touch traffic. That's not that hard to do. And some moms are afraid to let their kid driving. I said, get out in the middle of a big parking lot, find the one that has no light poles, so there's nothing to hit, and that's where you start. Giant, big parking lot when nobody's there. That's excellent. Temple, when you, in the movie Temple Grandin, and you've talked about it before, uh, about your sensory uh, needs, in you in the movie it talks about how you developed a, a squeeze box for yourself. Well, I was uh, I, when I got into puberty, I started having horrendous, terrible panic attacks. Okay. And when I was out of my aunt's ranch, I was 15 years old, and I noticed that when they put the cattle in the squeeze chute for their vaccinations, they kind of relaxed. Of course, I went and tried out the squeeze chute. And there are some people, not everybody, where deep pressure calms them. You might use a weighted vest, a weighted blanket. Some of this has the same effect. So I built my squeezing machine. Another thing that helped with my anxiety attacks was heavy exercise. Not walking, but a burst of heavy exercise. Mm. And I'm also taking antidepressants, which I write about in my book, Thinking in Pictures. I have my own personal experiences in Thinking in Pictures, antidepressants. I've been on them since 1980, over 40 okay. years. I don't okay. dare stop taking them. That's why I have to drink so much water because of the side effect of a dry mouth. They saved me. Absolutely, totally saved me. That's probably a good subject. I and mean, I think a lot of people would, would appreciate maybe a little more attention to. Uh, you know, a handful of years ago, every, I mean, I, I'm, I'm overgeneralizing, but seemed pretty close to it. Every child that I ended up having the fortune to, you know, work with was being you know, was on some form of medication. And today it's a lot less. Well, a lot of families- They give out way too many drugs to little kids, way too many drugs. So I'm sure there's a lot of families out there that are, you know, in a position of how do I navigate whether or not my child does benefit from it or not? Do you have any thoughts around that subject? Well, basically I don't want to see antipsychotics given out to three-year-olds like candy. There's way too many side effects. Yep. But I- the first thing, if you try a medication, you try one thing at a time. Or a supplement, you try one thing at a time. If you started a new school at the same time you tried a med, you're not going to know what worked. Good point. Another basic principle is it should have some wow factor. When I went on the antidepressants, two days later, I started feeling a lot less anxious. It had a big wow factor. That's important. Now, another mistake that people make is you're on the drug for a while, whatever it is, it seems to be working, and then it seems to wear off. Now, that happened with me, but I toughed out that period of anxiety. It was like a cycle, and I went through. And okay. I've been on the same dose ever since. You don't want to get into an escalating dose situation. You're really going to get into a mess with that. Okay. And, and where the antidepressants work, things like Prozac, uh, Fluoxetine, or Zoloft, or Lexapro, uh, is for anxiety. And the mistake that gets made is that a low dose works really well, and then they raise it, and you get agitation and insomnia. I probably have had 100 parents say, oh, low dose worked. We gave him a high dose. He almost went crazy, and we'll never touch that drug again. Because the mistake that gets made with antidepressants, and it's all explained in thinking in pictures, and even though it's 25 years old now, it's still accurate. The meds have not changed very much. I keep up on that. Yeah. All you've got now is what they call patent extenders. That's okay. what they call them in the drug industry, patent extenders. And you tweak the formula a little bit so you get a new patent, and then you rip everybody off on it. <laughs> and then to get it cleared by the FDA, you just test it against placebo. Yeah. You don't find out if it works better than Prozac. They don't do that. It's just the placebo. And then they do these little dinky eight-week trials that aren't long enough to get some of the bad side effects. Yeah. Now you take drugs like Respiridol or, or Abilify, uh, uh, there's some, they have a lot more severe side effects, obesity, diabetes, yeah. you know, shaking, uh, things like that. And originally developed for schizophrenia, 
And okay. if you're schizophrenic, uh, they, they can work wonders. Uh, but they have a lot more side effects than some of the other meds. And I discuss meds in thinking in pictures and in the way I see it. But my approach is the younger the kid, the more conservative you want to be with medication. But then you get grownups like me that um, are um, really anxious. Now you've got people self-medicating with pot. This is a problem. I looked up some really scary, bad stuff that the pot my generation took. Yeah. The stuff you got today is five times stronger than the stuff I took. I was shocked. And yeah. then you take too much of that. Instead of calming you down, it can make you paranoid and anxious. Yeah. Yeah, this is not good. I, and I, the developing brain should not be touching marijuana. Now, yeah. CBD, that's a product of the marijuana plant that doesn't have the THC, the stuff that makes you high. Yeah. CBD can help with certain types of epilepsy. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I was horrified to find out, you know, how potent this new pot is. And I'm just not, uh, I, okay, somebody didn't catch the names of the books. I talked about the way I see it, the way I see it, my most general book, Calling All Minds. Calling All Minds, my kid's book, and Thinking in Pictures, which is my autobiography. And yeah, I think I've, there's a question about medication. I think I've pretty well answered that one about medication. The Loving Push is a book I did with, um, uh, with Deborah Moore. And uh, we discuss a lot about the problems of the video game addictions. We've got to control that. Now, today with lockdown and everything screens, I think a little bit of those games where they can talk to each other is okay, where the kids get socialization through a video game, but we, we can't do eight hours a day of that. And let's just use this time to learn skills. Home Depot's never had it so good. They're selling home improvement stuff. Man, the garden department's going, <laughs> going crazy selling garden stuff. I mean, people have been doing a lot of those kind of things. No, in yeah. CBD, I want to make it very clear. Somebody's saying that CBD has been amazing. CBD is totally different than marijuana and THC. And, uh, and, some, and, and that doesn't have the stuff that makes you high. It yeah, seems that's, to be, that's yeah, the really important thing. In the, for lack of better words, Temple, in the field of autism, that is a, 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 a pretty uh, significant issue right now. Is CBD beneficial to individuals who specifically have self, uh, you know, uh, maybe like harm, self-harm. Well, if you try it, you, well, the thing, that'd be something, that'd be a reasonable thing to try. Yeah. I mean, this is where, where, uh, see, the problem you got with autism is it's so heterogeneous. It's so variable. And I think we've got a bit of a mess since they've changed the, the DSM and took the Asperger's out, which was basically socially awkward with no speech delay. So now you've got Silicon Valley programmer in the same word, the same word is used for it, as you've got somebody maybe self-injuring themselves and is nonverbal. That doesn't make much sense to call that all the same word. And, and um, so when if kid, someone asks me, what do I do with the you know, three-year-olds? I can give you kind of a standard answer. But if a teacher says, what do I do with autistic kids in the classroom? Well, I need to know the age. Okay, then what's the problem? See, talk, I got to get some idea of where his level is. And what's his problem? Is it being bullied? Is it noise sensitivity? And he can't do math? What exactly is the problem? See, that's the, that's the thing. I've got to ask more questions. I don't have enough information to, to solve the problem. Okay, anybody else got any other questions? I'm looking through the questions right here. Um, yes, this is a good question to Sarah. She talks about traumatic brain injury. Yes, traumatic brain injury can have a lot of the same sensory problems as, um, as a developmental disorder can have. You can get some of the same sorts of things. And there's different, you know, some people have visual sensitivities, some have touch sensitivities. Now, if you've got a little baby that doesn't want to be touched, one thing that can help is deep pressure. 
There's a doctor down in Texas who's taking babies that maybe, you know, drug addicted mothers, uh, various trauma things or whatever, uh, don't want to be touched. Uh, they're telling the parents, the mom to go to Walmart and buy one of those baby pouches and just carry the kid around for four hours a day. And that deep pressure in that vestibular can help it. Certainly not to hurt it any. And I would recommend, you know, you buy it at Walmart or some other store. Don't make a homemade pouch. I'd be scared of dropping the kid. You know, you buy a commercial one. Sure. But that's, um, that's an easy thing that can be tried. Temple, when we were talking uh, earlier in the week, um, one of the subjects came up about um, an, a, a child who maybe is displaying a significant amount of self-injurious behavior uh, and kind of risky behavior and how, yes, that's problematic, and looking at that in terms of potential uh, interests for that child. Like you gave an example of an individual, I think, who um, engaged in some problem behavior, if you will, and ended up uh, working for like cell towers or something that had a little well, bit. What of I was talking about was the kids that um, you've got certain kinds of kids that, you know, the risk takers, the kind of like danger. Uh, this yeah. is a boy that's in a whole piles of trouble kid. Yeah. Now let's now let's go install radio towers, climb up cell phone towers. We got some really fun, scary jobs to do on the high tension electric towers when they're hot. You really want to give these kids a thrill, and they kind of like the it, it. These things can be done safely if you do them right, and they're using the right equipment. But that sort of like there's a high place, or you're this you're this far away from a hot wire, um, that really turns some of those kids on. And we need people to do those jobs. Now, you want the, the scariest ones of those jobs that actually saw was I turned on the weather channel one night in a hotel and they had a helicopter. I'm not kidding. This far from a hot, high tension electric line. And they were working on it with their bare hands. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, the helicopter touches the tower, you're fried. Yeah. Yeah, you see, that's, um, um, and I can, I had an interesting uh, trip one time with a guy who worked on high steel, this was last year after an autism talk on, on buildings in Denver, doing the framework up really high. And he says, when I was a teenager in my 20s, I was an angry young man, I'm not angry now. I got into doing high steel and I'm, and I'm really proud of the work I've done and the frameworks of buildings I've put up in Denver. Yeah. And the anger went away. Yes, he would have had fall protection on, where in yeah. the old days they didn't. I did roofing when I was in high school without fall protection. No, yeah. they don't do that now. Uh, yeah. It's very different how they do construction compared to when I was doing it. Um, but uh, doing this job up on this high steel framework, um, this guy settled down. He's married, and none of his anger stuff went away. And he had, and he's doing work he can be proud of. So you mentioned put that steel framework up. You mentioned some other stuff too that you know as I shared. A lot of the people who are participating in this um, presentation right now are in you know very rural communities where there's a lot of 4-H, a lot of animals. 4-H of is great. Let's get involved in 4-H, FFA. You make sure you keep FFA in your schools. 4-H is a great program. Get kids in, in that. Now, this year, COVID just ruined the state fair for some of the kids you know, showing lambs. Here in Colorado, we canceled our state fair, but they kept the livestock show with social distancing. And well, how does it? How would this benefit children, you know, on the spectrum? Well, responsibility for that animal. Okay. Let's start out with a lamb or a goat or a small animal. First of all, you got you're responsible for that animal to feed it and take care of it, and that's an important thing. And you're responsible to learn how to show it. You've got to train it. You see, that teaches important skills. And the uh, COVID messed up a lot of stuff. And then some local counties, somebody just mentioned here on the chat, are doing did virtual showing. That you know, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And somebody else asked me about romantic relationships. Well, I saw too many bad marriages. Yep, that was um, never got to find a model I could see myself in. <laughs> so I kind of got married to my career. Yep. 
And, and the thing I'm thinking now at the age of 73, you know, what should I be doing now? I figure if I can do this talk and it helps some kid or some young adult out there to have a good life rather than playing video games in the basement, then I've done something worthwhile. I'm trying to get you to look at things differently because I've spent a big part of my career out in the industrial world and also rural cattle world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I go to an autism meeting and then I go on and do talks at Silicon Valley and, and I go, oh man, autistic sheltered workshop out there. Yeah. They don't realize it and they make a hundred and some thousand dollars a year. Sure. And then I go back to an autism meeting and a 10 year old walks up to me. All he wants to do is talk about his autism. I'd rather talk about his dog he's trained or his telescope. You know, some other thing that that's an interest. You know, that, that is interesting. It, early in the presentation, you talked about, you know, the idea of, you know, that you are an individual with autism is not primary. It's an important part of who I am because I just can't believe how rational the world is. Yeah. Uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, well, some of the stuff gets political, so I'm going to stay out of it. So I'm going to talk about a safe one, airplane trails. Okay. Yeah. Airplane trails are a government plot. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you about this funny flight I was on. I was sitting in the middle seat on a flight and this other girl was sitting in the window and she was showing me this dumb website <laughs> that was on a phone about airplane trails. And just as she was showing me like the stupidest stuff on it, out the window, there was a Southwest Airlines plane going by and leaving a trail. I said, look, that's Southwest Airlines. <laughs> and it's leaving a trail. <laughs> that's what those lines in the sky are. And yeah. what, and what, and then the way the temperature is and the humidity is then that, that determines whether or not they show. But, I don't know. I'm an extremely logical, uh, logical person, and I and some of this uh, garbage I just can't believe people believe. So a lot of people who a I, lot of individuals who are who have ASD talk about uh, this idea of interpretation or engagement with their surroundings is very literal. Is that a fair statement? Well, that's a fair statement. And one of the problems is black and white thinking. So let's talk about um, good and bad. Okay. Well, as you get more information. You can learn that there's degrees of good and bad. Robbing a bank is not as bad as killing somebody. If I stole a paperclip from a store, that's not as bad as robbing a bank. Right. And maybe gum on the teacher's chair is less bad. You see, you can put, start to put things into categories of badness. Yeah. And I'll put the Holocaust at the top of the list for the worst thing that people ever did. You see, I'm put, but, but in order to make categories of degrees of badness, I have to have enough experiences so I can put specific examples into the different levels of either good or bad. Maybe Mother Teresa's like on the top of the list for being good. Yep. Oh, I think I, I did pretty good for returning two wallets at the airport. And since I'm a visual thinker, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the money clip rolling around on the x-ray machine belt, guy's <laughs> credit card and license in it. And I gave it to the security guard and I heard an announcement for it. Yep. And the guy probably got his money clip back. Okay, that's doing something good. It's not Mother Teresa. But teach the golden rule one example at a time. I try to be a good teacher and mentor my students. It, it's, uh, there's different degrees of, of goodness. Okay, I hold the door open for somebody at the store. That's good. Yep. But returning that money clip and then the lady's wallet was on the toilet paper rack in the restroom and I took it to the uh, information desk and she got it back. Yeah. In terms of kind of when, when we are communicating maybe during teachable moments for individuals with autism, it's been shared often to keep it very black and white, your statement. Don't get into innuendos. Oh, or no, basically what mother would say, okay, let's say I put my fingers in the mashed potatoes. Yeah. Instead of screaming, no, she just quietly said, use the fork. Yeah. Or, and she might say, use the fork. People, people think it's disgusting when you use your fingers. And that's okay. it. And that's it. Right. Very, very clear and to the very point. Very clear. And yeah. the, then the reason for it is because to other people, it looks disgusting. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, it, it's just very, very clear. It's helpful. Temple, I want to be very sensitive to your time. I know that we did not get far into these slides. However, no, the that's all right. I, I uh, okay, so I'm okay. the most important. And I've talked about most of the other stuff. Now, people want to have the slides. There's a lot of stuff on them. NASA geek stuff. Yeah. Uh, interesting thing. When I went um, to NASA, I found out there was a guy with Tourette's that built a launch pad. Another guy designing control rooms who was dyslexic. You see, these are the things I learn as I go back and forth between these worlds. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is bust a lot of people out of the autism box. But you see, the thing is, is, is then you've got somebody who's nonverbal. Okay, and I get asked about that. I'll give you some really good books to read for nonverbal. There's a book Please. called, oh, yeah, you might want to look at my brain scans. Turns out I've got a big, big visual thinking circuit. A really big one goes all the way back to primary visual cortex but I can't do algebra and then the multitasking problem I'm I have no working memory see that's something I have to do a workaround interesting like I, I can't remember a phone number I have to write them down and that's because I just don't have any working memory I've got lots of long-term memory if I can convert something to a graphics file then I can remember. Do I remember every hotel room I ever stayed in? No, I don't. I only remember the really weird and the really awful. And I remember this one dreadful hotel. They thought they were so trendy. Bare concrete walls with the snap tie holes showing in them. I'm going really construction site chic. But the thing I really hated was the breakfast. They went out and they got pint ice cream containers. And you got your breakfast thrown into that with a half raw poached egg on the top. Yeah. Heck, do young people, that's supposed to cater to young people. Young people really want to eat breakfast out of an ice cream container. <laughs> I was like so trendy, it was stupid. And I said, and I, we, this is when I was out doing the book thing and Brad uh, travels with me, the book table. I said, Brad, we're never staying here at one of these hotels ever again. Yeah. I, a question came came to me um, from one of one of the viewers, and it was asking. This is from the professional community. Um, so a lot of people, some of the people who are participants in this, um, do ABA work. Yep. And yep. one of the questions was, uh, we you know are providing recommendations, providing or in in providing sessions, let's say daily, you know. Yep. Normally, uh, that's what I had speech therapy sessions like it was three times a week but yeah. I mean I had yeah, lots of one-on-one -on -one teaching how about when outside of those sessions when the therapist wasn't there was your mother still was your mother learning what to do and continuing that stuff uh, so I guess the question is from the professional community providing services what was your what would be your recommendations for parents in terms of continuing the the targets the interventions the exposure the high expectations well uh, we would do a lot of turn taking games at home lots yeah. and lots of turn taking games uh, you always want to encourage the child to use the words you yeah. know you want something I'll say use your words but you've got to give them time to respond that gets back to that slow processor you're going to have to give them time to uh, time to respond. I'm uh, sitting at the table, Miss Manners meals. One of the things that helped me was old-fashioned 1950s upbringing. And and if I went over to the Woods house and I had rotten table manners, Mrs. Wood would correct me the same way my mother would. This is what was done in the 50s. I went to the store and I was touching too much stuff. The clerk stopped it. Yeah. Grown-ups corrected young children in the 50s no matter where they went you know, you're not ups corrected you're little kids you're not seeing the same amount of that today then and i think that's part of the problem but that was standard 50s i yeah. knew if i went miss edson's toy store and i touched too much, too much stuff miss edson would get after you for that <laughs> you know now kids are pulling stuff off the shelf of walmart making a giant mess and 
no, they, they, the clerks would have been stopping that in the 50s. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, associates. They're called associates now. Right, right. No, that would have been stopped in the 50s. They didn't let kids make messes in stores then. Yeah. And also, kids were in stores shopping, and they were expected to behave. Yeah. You know, one of the things that you brought up when we were talking earlier this week as well, and I thought it was very valuable, really very valuable. And often I don't see parents kind of focusing on this. And I respect the fact that it, they may not have the resources to be able to do this, but being able to take care of themselves. You know, you use the example of, look, if you're in the airplane and some, there's an emergency, you need to put on the oxygen mask before you can help your child. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of, you know, the fam parents taking care of themselves? Yes. yes, and I've had students too where I've actually downloaded that airplane safety thing. And they say that you've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first, because if you don't, you're going to pass out before you can help anybody else. Yeah. And, and uh, mother did some semi-professional theater. And one thing that's needed, and I know this is, you know, if you're a single mom, I don't know how it's very difficult to do this. But the parent needs to have some time where they can do some of their own stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, they just get completely frazzled. You know, that, that can be a really, you know, big, gigantic issue. You yeah. know, when mother realized that she had to have some stuff that was for her to do. Yeah. One of the things that we often see a lot is, you know, if, uh, especially a young, you know, a family with a young child receiving a diagnosis, and if there's a lot of challenges, there's a fear of separation from the child, and there's a fear of, you know, going out into the community itself, which I, I understand. Um, but it seems, at the same time, there's got to be a way to try to learn how to take care of yourself as an individual, as well as how to provide your child to exposure to those challenging situations as well. Is that well, fair? One of the things that, you know, on discipline, there's someone uh, named, somebody named Cherish just uh, wrote about that. Okay. Temper tantrum. The rule was no television for one night. Whether I had it at school at home, and if I had it at school, the teacher called up my mother. Again, this was the two working together, very consistent, um, very, very consistent rules. And they didn't um, go, ah, we're going to take that TV away. They didn't do it like that. They'd wait until the temper tantrum was all calmed down. They put me in my room, all calmed down. Then they'd say, you can join the family now. You know the rule, no television tonight. And it was done very consistently, real consistent like that. And That's how it was done. With follow through, you're saying. Yeah, and it was very consistent. Temper tantrum equaled no TV for one night. And they didn't take, this is in elementary school, and they didn't take it away for two weeks because I'd give up. Yeah. Now right. you could have a situation where a kids doing a behavior so often taking stuff away doesn't work. Then you're going to kind of do it the other way where you're going to go a longer and longer period of time of not doing the behavior. That's gotcha. hurting themselves. I understand. They could go longer and longer times of not trying to do it and get a reward. Now, sometimes on self-injury, um, doing the sensory integration type of things, the airs sensory integration, like swinging, balancing exercises, pressure, that's now an evidence-based method. And I'm not, you see, you get into whether it's ABA or whether it's uh, sensory integration, well, I'll use both. And there's been uh, some, some advocates on the spectrum that are anti-ABA. Now, there's some old-fashioned ABA. I think it's just terrible. Yep. And then you've got the modern, flexible kind. Yep. You see, there's a whole, you know, there's some old-fashioned bad stuff yeah, that I definitely don't like. Yep. And where they totally sort of almost deny biology. Some yep. of the newer, flexible ABAs, very similar to what was done with me. Right. Well, I think mother knew that she couldn't just shove me into total noise. And so at my birthday parties, we didn't have noisemakers. Right. But now, knowing what I know, what we probably would have done is bought some noisemakers beforehand. Right. I could practice with. Yeah. And you get to make Again, sure. that would make it not be a surprise. And then we could decide whether or not to have noisemakers. And maybe I'd pick out, pick out one of them. Well, on, on that subject where you, you know, kind of brought up ABA, and yes, that is something, I, I'm an ABA provider myself. Oh, yeah, and a lot of people are. Yeah, I'm very, absolutely. I'm very cognizant of, you know, the history of it. 
and there's a lot of misunderstanding about ABA today. Inside this subject also is neurodiversity. Have you, you know, the, the idea of the neurodiversity associated to the individual who is on the spectrum and is not. Do you have any thoughts no, about that? I, I think I dress eccentric, but there's yeah. a scene in the movie where they slam the deodorant down on the table yeah. and um, they say, you stink, use it. That scene happened. Yeah. Okay. And at the time I was upset. No, you got to clean it up. Yeah. And you can't go around calling people stupid and things like that. You just can't do that. Right. You know, some manners. Um, that doesn't mean that makes you, you somebody else. Eccentric's fine. Rude, filthy, and dirty's not fine. You can't have giant anger attacks at work and throw things. Yep. I used to work in construction. People were not throwing tools. Right. That would not be tolerated. Um, it's just too dangerous. Sure. Um, it, it's... Uh, you know, there's some things that you, you got to do. But on the other hand, let's look at diversity. Diversity is good in thinking. You see, my kind of mind does, let's say we go back to that poultry plant. Yeah. Who designs what in it? The clever equipment is done by the visual thinkers that can't do algebra. Yeah. But who designs the boilers and refrigeration? My mind doesn't do that. I don't understand that stuff. I'm afraid of that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you and that's the more mathematical uh, uh, part of it. The structure of the building, that's done by the more mathematical engineers. We still are doing that, but we've lost the shops for making the other stuff and we're importing it over in a hundred shipping containers. And we used to make all this stuff. I've been in this industry for 47 years. Yeah. And, and now we're finally starting to realize that, you know, we need to put these kind of things back in. Somebody what do you asked mean? what ABA is. Okay, it's applied right. behavior analysis, is a you know or discrete trial therapy. Well, my speech teacher did a simple version of that. She'd hold up a cup, right? She'd hold this up, and she'd say, she'd say cup, and then she'd then she stretch out the syllables cup. She'd go back and forth saying cup and cup, and then I said it, and she praised me. So a ABA is primarily a way of reinforcing target behaviors is a, a short answer to that. Tem Temple, what are your thoughts about an individual on the spectrum with inclusion? Jen well, I want to see little kids included as much as possible. I was mainstreamed into a, to a normal elementary school. Yep. Now there was only 12 kids in a class, old fashioned 50s, sit at the desk classroom. It worked for me. If I'd been in 30 kids in a classroom, I would have had to have had an aid. Yep. Now I want to see, especially the younger kids, included just as much as possible. I was a teenager that didn't work in a regular high school. And there's some kids that almost need to, you know, smart kids need to almost skip the teenage years and go from a child to being an adult. Well, I want to get them working. And, and I'm, because I'm looking at, we got to look at what's the goal of education. And I think what we basically got to say, where is a student 10 years after high school? 10 years after high school, I had my master's degree and I was working on that dip fat project that was shown in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And I can think of whole tons of places I don't want. Them. Yeah. Because socializing with teenagers is not a life skill that I actually need to have. Yeah. Well, I do wonder about some of it sometimes about how our kind of society's expectations just on any individual in regards to what socialization is and needing to be a part of, you know, groups and things like that. Some people just aren't naturally motivated for that type of lifestyle. I think it's, and then when you throw in an, an individual who has autism, there's this tendency to almost want to force them to be social. Well, they need to be, you see, I, see, for me, picking up business social, I can be taught that. Right. Um, I learned how to cold call on phones. I got good at doing that on selling jobs. Yeah. Real good. Um, but there's a certain kind of social chit chat where they're having such a great time, like maybe at a brew pub or something, and I can't hear a thing in those places. Um, chit chat where the conversation has no, there's no informational content and they're having a great time. Yeah. And I find that a total bore. 
Where on the other hand, um, I can be interested in a lot of different things. And if we're discussing something interesting about how to do sailing, like how to rig a sailing ship or something like that, I would find that interesting. Yeah. Um, because it contains information. But there again, it's about exposure, finding an interest, taking advantage of that to be able to teach skills too. But I got, I got friends through shared interests. Yeah. That's where I got friends. Yeah. And so what we need to be doing with the teenagers and even with the young kids is get them into the robotics club, yeah. the debate club, the chess club, the computer programming club, choir, band, yeah. all of those kind of things. Sure. Theater, when they get that going again. Yeah. Because these are all things that can lead to careers. Yeah. Temple you know, today, if somebody wrote, they'd love to see the small classrooms, you don't have them. In those big classrooms, a lot of, I would have needed an aid in, in a lot of the classrooms today. And what, what would the aid have done for you? Well, just to help keep me on task. And in a big classroom, there'd be too much stuff I could do over in the corner. And, and also, in some of the classrooms today, the kids are doing different things in the same room. That wasn't true in the 50s. You know, we'd have reading, for example, in third grade. I remember this. And each child would take turns reading. And yeah. then, then I remember in third grade, I learned borrowing and subtraction. My teacher called it black magic. And I remember her showing on the board how to do it. And we all sat there and learned how to do it. And then we had a little worksheet we had to do. Is there I anything? I remember doing some of this stuff. Is there anything from your childhood in terms of supports that were um provided that you felt were ineffective well they didn't understand a lot of the sensory issues i had to um um you know itchy clothes i mean yeah, my still a problem with that they've cheapened up a lot of cottons um you know and then somebody mentioned here sarah johnson just mentioned um well even one teacher can't measure that big classroom you know there's a point where you're getting a getting the classroom just uh, too big you know, it's, there are going to be problems even with so-called normal kids. Yeah. Um, but one thing that really helped, there was very consistent discipline between home and school. Mother and the teachers were on the same page. And, uh, yeah, that's what she told me, borrowing and subtraction was black magic. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, then I look at some of this common core stuff and I'm going, oh man, I don't understand this. Uh, I think some of this stuff, I. Uh, I looked up like the third grade lessons for that and I had a hard time understanding it. <laughs> sure, sure. Temple, I want to be I want to be fair to you. It it is a half hour past the amount of time that you, know, you I just got to make sure I'm ready for my next Oh, I still have half an hour. I got about 15 minutes before I got to go into my next appointment. <clears throat> okay. Well, maybe uh, we'll take a well, look. Well, I have to do the Brazil conference, try to do that. Just shows another there now that All right. Now that slide right there that just went up there. That shows where there's water in there that's the um the processor's not there yeah <laughs> i don't have it you have to do a work around you i'm not gonna be able to do busy takeout window but there's plenty of other jobs uh, and the other thing i couldn't possibly have done old-fashioned cash register make change i would have been fired from that job <laughs> fortunately today they're automatic yeah yeah but there's some things i couldn't do you see doing design work that doesn't put any load on working memory. I'm doing that all out of long-term memory. You see now push for pro the progress. You've got to stretch. Now some kids, you've got to be a lot more careful about not driving them into sensory overload. That's it. You don't just take them and shove them in a bunch of noise. You don't do that. It, there's sort of an instinct almost that a teacher has to have them what to push. Because if you don't push some, they don't develop. When I was, had the chance to go to my aunt's ranch when I was 15, I was afraid to go. Mother gave me a choice. Not going was one of them. I could go for a week or I could stay all summer. And I got out there, loved it, and I stayed all summer. Or another kid scared to go to sleepaway camp, gets out there and loves it. And I really liked this camp they had in Kearney, Nebraska, because they were getting kids out on, nonverbal kids out on boats. And the mom would go, Good. You got my kid on a boat? You got to be kidding. Or you got my kid on a zip line? You really got to be kidding. Now, they don't just shove them into these things. You know, they let them watch. But they were getting their kids to do some things that they wouldn't have done otherwise. You don't just shove them into a, to I call it throwing in the deep end. 
You yeah. don't do that. But you stretch and you give choices. That's what my mother always used to do. That'd be the same thing to do with the masks. Yeah. Well, we can go look at Amazon. We can go shopping in a store for them. Yeah. We can wash it before you wear it. Then it'll be softer. It kind of, it accomplishes the goal, but it allows the child to have some control. Over Absolutely. It. You're going to have to wear one. And I don't know. This thing on Southwest Airlines is bad. The CEO of Southwest Airlines is on national TV. And it's yeah. Yes. Yeah. But on the other hand, I've worked with a lot of big corporations and I can also see their side of it too. And no, we work to get the kid to tolerate the mask, but we don't try to do it at the airport. Well, I think that's the thing. We, you know, it, it is a lot about that practicing, you know, and a lot of the professionals in this, you know, uh, in, you know, on this do, do a lot of, you know, assessing where is, the, where's the area of concern or where are the deficits and let's practice these things so that when it comes to the real situation, we've got some skill sets. Well, the other thing is not having a surprise. Like the more you learn about things, I used, I used to be a white knuckle flyer because when I was a senior in high school, we had to have an emergency landing and I went down the slides. But then after I got to go on these planes, they hauled cattle on and I got to ride in the cockpit. They also abused these planes really badly. They were really yeah. nasty to these aircraft and they still flew. <laughs> this is early 70s. Yeah. And av aviation became interesting. You see, sort of the more you learn about something, and but you don't want to get into the airport and then find out the security guards are touching your kid and now he's screaming. Right. Well, you don't want to walk into that kind of a surprise. I think and there are you some. Watch all the videos of it and yep. explain, and then you could even practice it a little bit how they might touch you. They might not touch you, but they might need to touch you, and this is what they're going to do. Well, it's if not a surprise. I think there are a couple airlines, Temple, that actually do allow you to go through a practice run. If you, yeah, they do. They do. Okay. Yeah, there's some that do. That's. I mean, that's fantastic. Yeah, and they do that for people that are afraid of flying. They actually have schools, and you, and you finally actually have a graduation flight that's basically fly around the airport a couple of times. Oh, really? Yeah, now that costs some money to do that. You have sure to pay for that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but this whole principle of not having surprises. So you know up front. Okay, like when I was a little kid, I, hate, I hated getting shots. Here's how not to do it. And I was a real little kid, and they sat me on the table, said, look out the window at the bird feeder, look at the pretty birdies, and they shoved a shot in my arm, and I hit the seal. So the way we dealt with that after that is that we went, and I still didn't like the doctor's office, but the thing that helped a whole lot is when we went into the doctor's office, we'd go in the office part of the desk first, and we'd look at the records to see if I had to have a vaccination. Huh. And if I had to have one, we did it first to get oh. it over with. Then the rest of the exam, I could relax. Or we'd go, well, you don't need one this time, and I can relax. But that made it, it still wasn't fun. But I then, that got rid of the suspense. Okay, I listens to my heart, and he looks in my ears and everything. Am I gonna have to get a shot? No, we just dealt with that right in the beginning. And that solved a lot of the problem. Perfect. And that yeah. wasn't, a, wasn't a difficult thing to do. Yeah. It was an easy thing to do. Thoughtful. You know, and I, I kind of approach it sort of more like the engineering approach. Uh, what is the problem? You know, there's a lot of choices now for clothes that aren't going to itch. A lot of choices. I still have got problems with that. Yeah. So I guess in a, in a sense of kind of closing up a little bit for you, because I know you've got, um, you know, some other appointments today. Well, I've got to do the Brazil thing over again. We're going to just record it. There you go. So today for you, Temple, with, you know, specifically in, in you know, looking back on the past, your development over time, being who you are today on the spectrum, Are you, do you still have to daily, do you still think about it? Do you still recognize the advantages, if you will, for lack of better words, or the challenges associated to autism as a, as a you know, mid 70 year old woman who's accomplished so much and has so much influence over others? Well, I look at it as a responsibility. And I figure in my, 
Um, one of my friends gave me this picture and you might be able to see it a little bit on that cabinet, but it's an elephant. And you see an elephant, so it's the old matriarchs that try to, you know, have to have wisdom. Yeah. And uh, I figure my job now is to help the younger ones to, you know, come along and be successful. Um, and just give out really practical advice, things that are going to work, and, and, and how, how do we solve problems? Okay, like how did I cope with lockdown? I've had all of my trips canceled. I was spending 85% of my time on the road doing talks. On March 12th was my last flight, and everything either got canceled, postponed, or went virtual. It was just that simple. Well, that sure tipped my world upside down. And so one of the things that helped me is to make sure I get up in the morning, take a shower, get dressed, dressed for work by eight o'clock. No pajamas. And then I, then I looked up life on the International Space Station. Now NASA has learned how to, how to have people living in close, close quarters. And one of the things they've learned is a schedule. They get them up in the morning. No, you can't wear your underpants all day. You gotta put your, you know, you have to put clothes on. Now you are allowed to have a few clothes from home, but you gotta be dressed. Yeah. And then they have their work. And then they have scheduled time off, free time. And then they have a midday meal. Everybody has to be together for that. And it's very cramped quarters. And there's some things that they've learned to help people get along. You know, and I thought that'd be a fun thing for kids to look up. You can just look it up online. You just type in life on the International Space Station video. I like and it. you can see cramped quarters, the parts of it are not going to be so fun. It's not all fun spacewalks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, these, these are, um, thought that might help some of the kids out. You know, now now right. they're not locked down the way it was. We, we, we were locked down pretty tight for about six weeks. Yeah. Tempo, I'm, I'm sure you know this, and I'm sure you hear this all the time, but um, the amount of impact and excitement and um, value that you provide to individuals, families, professionals is, is really outstanding. And I just, as one human being, I just want to share my great appreciation for having the opportunity to hear what you have to say, but more importantly, be able to have access to the work that you put in as a human being and all the things that you've accomplished as an individual. You're, you're not only, you know, got your PhD, but you are a college professor. You've influenced the cattle industry significantly to become more humanitarian towards the treatment of animals. You're, you're inside working with corporate industry, small private organizations. You, you just, as for one human being to have such impact on the world is commendable. And I just want to well, thank you. Thank you, you very much. Oh, there's a question here from Danielle we might need to address. Sure, and please. it has to do with, uh, you know, let's say a client doesn't want to do something. Okay. Uh, how much do you respect that? Mother always gave choices. Always gave some choices. And the thing is, I got out to the ranch and I liked it. Or the kid goes, no, nah, I'm not going to go on a boat. Well, you might give them a choice. You could try the boat or you could try, you know, some craft work. You know, you give them, you give them some choices. Uh, things like weaning off of video games. First of all, you do it slowly. Do not do it rapidly. And, and then the kid got to working on the cars and found out he liked that better. Well, you start out with maybe it's just an hour a day of doing that. See, this is where you've got to push some to get, progress because there's a tendency to go no then after you think about you think about it for a while you go well maybe maybe i should do that and i i was afraid to go to the ranch i got out there and i loved it and i'm really glad that i went because i wouldn't have been in the cattle industry if i hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch i mean this is where exposure to things then you find out okay i tried that and i really hated it but at least no, it's you tried not so it. different Right. It's not different than any of us. It is about, you know, experience, exposure. I mean, we don't know what we enjoy until we're put in the position to, you know, have to contend with it. Well, that's just it. And, and, um, um, 
you know, and I, I'm still kind of eccentric the way I dress, but that's okay to be eccentric. Sure. But I had to really clean it up. Filthy, dirty slob is not okay. Telling people off, it's not okay. Um, it's, see, this is a thing, like, well, if the client doesn't want to do something, uh, how, mar how hard do you push? Well, did I want to put all my classes online and cancel all my travel? Was that something I wanted to do? No. It was something I had to do. And this is where 25 years of heavy construction helped. Hmm. Because we'd have stuff go wrong on a job all the time. And then you had to figure out what to do about it. Like, couldn't get this part for some reason. All right, what are we going to do about it? Well, I went right into construction gear and I called up my computer guy. Oh, thank you, Chris. Wonderful computer guy. I called him up. And he went over to Best Buy and he bought the last mic the, that was in the storeroom that they said wasn't there, but he found it. It looks like, a, like something from a radio station. We bought the last mic that was available. <laughs> and you see, I moved on it. I had to. We had a week to get these classes online. And I had some um, lectures online. And then me and my grad student went in the classroom and we recorded them. You see, there was some had to. I had to. Now, the thing I'm finding for the stuff online, the reason why I didn't go through all these slides is because I'm finding that a conversation that we're doing now works better online than yeah. yakking the lecture around. You can give the slides to people. They can look at the slides. There's some okay. pictures. There's a bunch of cool stuff on there. Are you okay if I do make the slides available? You can to give the... them the slides. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, but they... they what I'm finding is what they call a flipped classroom is you put the lectures online and they're an hour and a half long and they can watch them in 20 minute segments. And then we talk about them online and the ones that just have the canned lectures with no live discussion. Those are awful classes online Sure. Yeah. on everything I've read about it. And everybody I've talked to that's taking classes online. I'm not going to say I got the best class online, but I don't think I got the worst class online. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons why I let this just go into the conversation because I think it works better online this way. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, for me, I've, I've seen your presentations, uh, you know, a handful of times. Uh, this, this format, as you're saying, I, yes, I'm thankful. It's funny, you know, we have this, this pandemic, but it's force, forcing us into learn new skills. And this whole Zoom technology and way of interacting is a new skill set. Well, you know, it's a new skill. Learning. What I think is going to happen with businesses the thing I really miss is the camaraderie at the office. Well, there's faculty members that are yeah. colleagues. I haven't seen them. Yeah. And, you, and you're no longer sort of bumping shoulders in the hall and then get an idea for a research project. Yeah. You see, that's the thing that everybody's really missing. Yeah, and I there's know. some good things. The fact that I was going to do a talk, there were 700 people to, for, the, for the talk in Brazil. Yeah. Now they're going to have to record it. They'll we'll translate it and have just put it up online. Yeah. Because Zoom's server went down in Brazil. Yeah. There's nothing we can do about that. Right. Well, um, we're, the whole uh, aspect of providing services right now for families, I mean, has shifted significantly throughout the entire country from, you know, the face to face in home or, or at, you know, clinic spaces. A lot of it is now happening over the internet. Well, there's some real messes, and about 30% of the kids are doing awful in school. Yeah. And then there's others, uh, but I think that we, we're not, they're not, like I had one, well, I have a drawing assignment in my class, and I gave my cell phone number out to the students. I got this one student, she's been texting me her drawings, and I've been critiquing them, and, and then other students um, are, they're not sending me the drawings. Yeah. They're not, they're not but then I'm getting them in, involved in, in the discussions. Yeah. And I'm finding that that's working better. Well, I tried an audio lecture online. Awful. I did it yeah. once. Never yeah. again. Awful. Yeah. The interactive. But you just, uh, uh, but the classes that the students seem to be liking better are the ones where we have these discussions and I get them online and I go through the toolbar and some of them have to be on the phone because some of the ranchers don't have internet. And 
Okay, you don't have your picture up there, but okay, Jim, you've, you got a call on them. Yeah. And I think the interactive approach is better for this. Yeah. And the slides will be put up on, we have a thing called Canvas. Yep. We'll put the slides up on Canvas. Yep. And there's a talk that's got a postage stamp of me this big, so it doesn't eat up too much bandwidth that they can watch. Yeah. Temple, that's you're, what, you're absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, I hope that we're fortunate to be able to do it again. I just want you to know that the community that you're speaking to is a very, is a generally speaking, a very rural community, uh, who don't always get access to, um, a lot of, um, for lack of better words, really established support structures, uh so for yourself to be taking the time out of your day and doing this is very no, i'm very really cool. glad to do this and rural community people got boats you got all kinds of fun stuff in the rural community oh absolutely there's more stuff available that we just how about a retired mechanic that loved to teach some kids auto mechanics yeah yeah perfect and there'll be some ancient old cars that are Beautiful. easy to understand you can start on yeah you know That's and fun. see if that bug bites Learn yep. what a carburetor is. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. And it, but the thing, even with the computerized cars, all those sensors still connect to a real thing, connect to the real world. Yeah. Yeah. You could start out, there's a lot of old cars in rural areas, and, 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 or an old motorcycle. Yep. One of my students who's really good at mechanical things, when he was about 12 or 14, he was given an old motorcycle. If you can make it run, you can have it. He made it run. Because motorcycles are still simple. Yeah. Uh, there's stuff like that that's just around. Yeah. Or a four wheeler, fix the uh, repair an old four wheeler that's broken. Yeah. Those are around in rural areas. Yeah, sure. There's all all kinds of stuff that's just in people's garages and things. Yeah, and we also like we talked about earlier. There's just so much outdoor activity that exists. Oh yeah, they can do all the outdoor stuff. One thing that happened here was hot, hot, hot. Is that everyone's going out in the river tubing. And yep. they were not getting sick doing it. That, even though it was very crowded, nobody yep. was getting sick out on the river. Yeah. And now it's getting too cold. We went from 100 degrees to snow in one 24 in hours. Day, it seemed, yeah. <laughs> totally crazy. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to have to get with the people with Brazil now. And okay. Try to do that over now. Temple, I'm going to just thank you for everybody who is participating here. Um, it's a small group but it's a powerful group of wonderful uh, professionals uh, and family members. And this is a great, great privilege. So thank you. I just told we kind of give them some different ways and let's look for things as a community. You've got good church groups. Yep. That's messed up with COVID, but that's perfect place. When finally we get a vaccine where you can teach 10 year old, 11 year old certain work skills, be an usher, pass the plate, help with the food, something that's a job they've got to do every week. And the parents are not the boss. And what's that cost? It costs nothing to implement that. And then you get a few people in the congregation to, to greet the kid and get him to shake hands. In the entertainment industry, that's called a plant. Okay, so in, an individual that is kind of well, told ahead get, of time. You get people that will come up to that kid that's dressed up in, his, in her, either his or his good clothes. Yep. And he's supposed to, he or she's supposed to pass the program out. And then, then that grown up will shake hands with the kid, teach him how to shake hands. Perfect. And you've set it up beforehand for them to do that. It's perfect. You might have three or four of those that do that. Excellent. Because when we were little kids, when we were eight, we had to dress up in our good clothes and we had to be the little host and hostesses at my mother's parties. Greet the guests, take the coats, serve the snacks. Every kid in the neighborhood did that. Did you enjoy doing it? I kind of enjoyed it. My brother despised doing it. <laughs> you know what my brother had to say about it? He said it helped him become a bank vice president because he could talk to older men easily. Ah, uh, well, see. He hated the parties, but he said it actually helped him. And then so the us <laughs> kids would do the uh, the cocktail hour. We never served alcohol. No, 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 no. Sure. Just snacks. Yeah. And and uh, then when it's time for the dinner, they chased us away. Yeah. But for <laughs> the cocktail hour, we'd greet them, take their coats, and taught social skills. That was another fifties thing that was done in our neighborhood. Yeah. Simple, easy thing to do. Yeah. Perfect. You teach everybody social skills. Okay, well, I got to get going to the other meeting. Fair enough. 
Temple, thank you so much. All right. Thank you very, very much. It was great to be there. Really a lot of fun. Enjoy yourself. Best of luck. Be safe. Okay. And maybe we'll see each other soon. All right. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank bye. you.